Uh, we'll, we'll come to points of order in due course, and I await the Honourable Gentleman's point of order with eager anticipation, as will the House. But first, we will have the statement by the Leader of the House and Lord President of the Council, Andrea Leadsom. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I should like to inform the House that in the event that the European Union Withdrawal No. 5 Bill receives Royal Assent today, the House may be expected to approve a motion relating to Section 1 of the Bill to seek an extension of the period specified in Article 53 of the Treaty on European Union. I will make further business statements as necessary this week at the earliest opportunity. Thank you. The Shadow Leader, Valerie Vaz. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Leader of the House for advance sight of the statement? And I just have four quick questions. Um, When is the motion likely to be tabled? How long will the Government give for uh, the debate? Um, Is the Government going to support EU Withdrawal Bill No. 5? And if so, will it definitely receive Royal Assent tonight? Well, I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Um, I can tell her that the motion will be tabled later this evening. Um, As she will be aware, if there are Lords' amendments coming back, then the House will consider them later this evening in line with the Bill. Um, The debate, if it is brought forward for tomorrow, that's subject to the Bill having received Royal Assent tonight, then um, it is not intended that that uh, motion will be with a Business of the House motion. Therefore, as a Proceeding under an Act, the debate tomorrow will be subject to the provisions of Standing Order 16. This means that the de- debate will last for 90 minutes. Sodium Cash. Uh, w- would the Leader of the House confirm that the bill that is currently going through the House of Lords at the moment is the biggest dog's dinner uh, yeah. of any bill that we've seen in recent times? Is the Government opposed to this bill? And will it do everything to defeat it? Well, I entirely agree with my honourable friend that this is a huge dog's dinner. Um, as I, as I um, mentioned to colleagues when we were looking at the business of the House motion, the European Union Notification of Withdrawal Act 2017, that was the Act to revoke Article 50, had two clauses containing only 58 words. It was debated for five full days in this chamber, and it seems inconceivable that Parliament has looked at this bill for the first time last Tuesday and has had just a few hours of debate across both houses. Uh, Pete Wishart. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. It's not so much a, a dog's dinner, it's a dog's Brexit. And um, I think that this is not, this is not just... Oh, come on, that was, that was all right, wasn't it? <laughs> Mr Speaker, they, <laughs> they're, they're simply managing this on a day-to-day crisis management basis. No one's really got a clue what the business will look like tomorrow afternoon, far less what the business is going to look like at the end of this week. And all, all strength to the, the guys in Ermin down the corridor. They've stuck diligently to this task and managed to get this, get this through the House. They're, they're currently adjourned for pleasure, so ah, I'm, ah. I'm pretty certain they're going to be enjoying that pleasure, but they will get back <laughs> on with dealing with this bill, and the Government will be obliged to come back tomorrow with the strictures of the bill that's now been passed by this House and will be passed by the House, House of Lords. A couple of questions to the Leader of the House. Will this take precedence over all government business tomorrow as we debate this? Why is there only one and a half hours given to this for consideration, given that there are likely to be a number of amendments that are going to be coming back from the House of Lords? Will she take this opportunity to remind all our honourable and right honourable friends on the back benches this isn't an opportunity to vote down this bill anymore. All we can consider is the amendments that are going to be put back by the House of Lords. Will she say something about what's going to be happening for the rest of the week? For example, are we going to be sitting on Friday? Are we going to have indicative votes at some point during this week? Are we going to hear what's been c- compiled together by this Labour and Tory like a Brexit sharing blame? Are we going to hear anything in the course of the next few days on any of these particular issues? And can we get to some sort of semblance about how we actually do business in the House? Because this really is, Mr Speaker, a dog's Brexit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Mr Speaker, I fear that the Honourable Gentleman might be insulting me somewhat as a keen Brexiteer. I also think he's not being very consistent because he usually likes to stand there and insult the other place and talk about how they should be gone and (laughs) abolished and reduced. And yet here he is, because they're giving him the answer he wants, he's praising them. That's not very consistent. It's rather like his approach to (laughs) referenda. He ignores those he doesn't like and insists on... uh, and insists on upholding those he does like. Um, he asks whether tomorrow, tomorrow's business, um, if it is the uh, motion under the bill that's currently in the other place, whether that will take precedence over other business. I, I sincerely expect not. And he asks about the rest of the week. He will know that uh, I have already announced the business for the rest of the week, and I've also made very clear that should we need to sit on Friday, it, obviously that will be a subject for um, deciding once we see the results of the European Council. I will always seek to give the House as much notice as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Ian Duncan Smith. Mr Speaker, can I uh, ask my right honourable friend if she absolutely confirms at all stages we continue to oppose this, and the government continues to oppose this, uh, any amendments in process. And secondly, does she not also agree with me there is a distinct irony in the sense that the other place spent what was really now two days debating this bill, we ended up with a tiny amount of time and ended up not even debating a report or third <laughs> reading, which is an absolute travesty for the <laughs> chamber that is meant to be the democratic chamber and the other one's the unelected chamber. Yeah. Well, my right honourable friend is exactly right that it should be for this House to make key decisions and instead here we have the unelected House which is um, making play with this bill which is absolutely unconventional for the procedures of this Parliament. Um, However, despite the Government's grave misgivings about this piece of legislation, for all the reasons that we have set out in the the debate, we will not prevent the Bill being presented for Royal Assent should it pass both Houses. It is a well-established convention that the Government has the ability to seek and negotiate international agreements, so there is also one amendment in the other place that the Government will support, and that is the Royal Prerogative Amendment, and there may be one or two others that seek to ensure that the prerogative is maintained as far as possible. I am grateful, Mr Speaker. It is the first opportunity I have had to raise this, Mr Speaker, but I did let the Leader of the House know I intended to do so. Uh, Last Thursday, in exceptional circumstances, the House was forced to adjourn early, and the debate on the 2019 loan charge, after 16 speakers and two hours 40 minutes of debate, was not afforded a ministerial response because the House had to adjourn early. So, given those sort of unprecedented circumstances, can we look at some way to rectify that position and actually get a proper ministerial response to that debate, please? Yes, well, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right to raise this issue, and I I fear that the House was perhaps a bit jealous of all the Cabinet leaks and decided to have one of its own. Um, And it was rather... uh it was rather a big problem for the House, and, and the Honourable Gentleman is right, the, the debate had to be adjourned. I have, in fact, already spoken to my Honourable Friend, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, who is very much looking forward to the resumption of that debate and to making his points, as well as facilitating those for the Opposition um, Financial Secretary, and I will announce that as soon as possible. Sir John Redwood. Why this undue haste? Why is the government conceding the bill it doesn't want before it's even had the amendments or the vote? And why hasn't it dug in over the need for a money resolution? Because this will be enormously expensive to delay the exit from the European Union, given the very high taxes they impose on us. Surely the leader should dig in on that and insist on the normal procedures applying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, my honourable friend is exactly right that if passed, this bill would place a severe constraint on the government's ability to negotiate an extension and reflect this new date in UK statute books before the 12th of April. The government does not accept that this bill is necessary and deeply regrets that the House has taken it onto itself to introduce a bill that has not had the proper preparation or scrutiny or drafting. It is of grave regret to the government, but nevertheless the government will abide by the law at all times. Mrs Ellen Goodman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Just to clarify precisely what the position of the Leader of the House is, is she saying that the Government does not intend to disagree with the amendment that was put forward in the other place by the former Lord Chief Justice? Um, well, the Honourable Lady will have to forgive me. I'm not sure which, which amendment she is referring to, and therefore I can't answer that question on behalf of the Government at this moment. Mr. Peter Bone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Could the Leader of the House explain why Her Majesty is being drawn into this matter by asking her to give royal assent immediately? Normally, sir, royal assent is done at Her Majesty's pleasure. It seems to me wholly inappropriate to be forcing Her Majesty into a political position. Well, my honourable friend, in raising this matter, is inviting me to involve uh, the monarchy in this uh, question, and I'm afraid it's not something I'm prepared to do other than to say that royal assent is given at the convenience of Her Majesty. Tom Bray. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I press the uh, Leader of the House on the matter of indicative votes, and when will we be, will we be able to have them, and um, will it include the option of linking the Prime Minister's deal to a people's vote? Well, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, the Prime Minister has said that she is seeking agreement uh, with an approach that the whole House can support as a way to ensure that we leave the European Union in a very short order. However, if the talks that uh, are underway now do not lead to a single unified approach very soon, then the Government will instead look to establish a consensus on a small number of clear options on the future relationship that could be put to the House in a series of votes. Sir Peter Bottomley. Following the point made by the Chairman of the Backbench Business Committee, as the loan charge debate was concluded uh, prematurely, is there a procedural question which might be considered both by the Leader of the House and perhaps by you, Mr Speaker, as to whether, if the House business collapses or ends earlier than expected, a proposed Government motion for business uh, the following <coughs> working day might be considered at the usual time? But at the moment, I, I'd be anticipated Government motions, yes. business coming forward late on Friday. It couldn't happen. I think we ought to have a procedure where that could happen. Well, I'm always keen to look very careful at uh, proposals made by honourable members right across the House, and I will certainly take away my honourable friend's suggestion. However, um, what I have discussed with you, Mr Speaker, and indeed with my honourable friend, the Financial Secretary to the Treasury, is that we will intend to bring back that debate for a resumption of the debate, where I would hope that those who already spoke in it would attend, those who were waiting to speak in it may have the opportunity to do so, and of course, importantly, the Government and the Opposition spokespeople will then be able to respond, um, hopefully giving some closure on that debate for the many people in the country who are very concerned about it. Mr. Kevin Brennan. Mr. Speaker, the House of Lords have completed the committee stage of the Bill and all of the amendments carried at the committee stage in the Lords have been supported by the Government Minister in the Lords. So can she confirm, as Leader of the House and the Cabinet Minister here in the Commons, that when they come back down the corridor to us later, that the Government will follow on from what's happened in the Lords and support those amendments? The Honourable Gentleman will know that whipping is a matter for the whips, and I'm not prepared to confirm from the dispatch box exactly how Government benches will be voting. Greg Hans. Speaker, rumours are uh, abound of an uh, ill-advised uh, customs union-based uh, Brexit in talks uh, with the opposition. Uh, will my right honourable friend agree that uh, this House would need time to debate the merits and demerits of a customs union uh, in some detail? And is she personally still opposed to a customs union with the European Union? <laughs> Well, what I can say to my right honourable friend is that any discussion of a new and different proposal would need to come before this House for careful discussion and consideration. And in answer to the second part of his question, I am absolutely opposed to remaining in the European Union's customs union. But I do think that if we are to leave the European Union in 
very short order, then we do need to be flexible and find a way forward that the whole House can support. Uh, Alan Brown. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Leader continues to complain about this bill, but the bottom line is this bill reflects the will of this House and the will of the other place. And is that parliamentary process not far more important than us as MPs having to turn on the TV to hear the, the Prime Minister's latest formulations and what she's thinking instead of her coming to the dispatch box? Well, the Honourable Gentleman isn't correct that I complain about it. I fundamentally object to it on the grounds that it is totally unconventional for this House where when people vote for a government, when they vote at the polling booths, then the government goes to form that government as Her Majesty's Government and then it is the convention that the government proposes the business and Parliament scrutinises it, amends it and rejects it. What doesn't happen normally for many, many years is that those who did not win that general election, who do not form a government and who do not have the confidence of this House should be putting forward any legislation, and particularly legislation of such significant constitutional implications as this bill. Jonathan Ginogli. Speaker, I very much support the realistic and pragmatic position currently being taken by my right hon. Friend, the Prime Minister. But I was looking at her letter to President Tusk of 5 April, where she requests an Article 50 extension to 30 June. In that letter, she says that if she can't get an agreement with the opposition, then a series of votes will be put to establish a position. But clearly, that in itself will require the support of the opposition. So could we say that not getting a deal with the opposition will probably lead to a long delay to Article 50? Well, I think we have, to, we have to consider step by step, and the Prime Minister has said that she wants to seek a way forward that the whole House can support. If that isn't possible, then she intends to come forward with a small number of options for the House to consider to seek another and perhaps slightly different way forward. And that is, that remains our intention, is to leave the European Union with a deal that both means we are leaving in line with the decision of the referendum in 2016, but that also protects our economy, protects jobs and protects our security. Jane Ryan. I'm very disappointed to hear the tone that the Leader of the House takes, and I think it um, absolutely demonstrates why we have such a problem here. She fails to acknowledge that the Government has no majority, has not managed to carry this House, does not have the confidence of this House, has spent a great deal of time on anything but the business we need to deal with, has been absolutely intransigent, intransigent. and this House, I think, if you think about it, the members think about the public out there watching this and listening to those responses, which basically seem to condemn this House and the responsible action it's taken. The public could well hold this House itself in contempt of our nation if this House did not take the action it was taken when we face this national crisis. This House is sovereign and the Government seems to reject that notion at every point and turn. Well, I'm sorry to say to the Honourable Lady, but um, what she has just said is not correct. This Government does have the confidence of the House. It is Her Majesty's Government, and this House, should it feel that it doesn't offer confidence in this Government, then it should, of course, hold a no-confidence motion. It did attempt to do that, and it lost. So, as a matter of fact, this Government does have the confidence of the House. But the second thing to say is that this Government has sought at all times to find a deal that honours the referendum in 2016 and enables the UK to leave the European Union in a way that ensures we meet the will of the people, but at the same time 
deliver a, a, a deal that protects our economy and protects our security. That's what this government has sought to do, and what Parliament has then done is to reject every attempt to get a good deal that works for the whole United Kingdom. So I'm absolutely always keen to hear from honourable and right honourable members, but it is the fact that this government carries the confidence and Parliament has failed to support the will of the people in the referendum in 2016. Uh, Richard Drax. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this is an abomination of a bill. It's not what MPs in this House should be saying, I say to my right honourable friend. It is the people of this country who we swore we would leave after two years, and we are not. Now, the Leader of the House is now saying, as I understand it, that she's pursuing a soft Brexit. As I understand it, we are due to leave on the 12th of April, still this Friday. Would it not be ironic if it is the EU that throws us out, not us fulfilling our honourable duty? Well, my honourable friend is correct that the legal date of leaving the European Union is indeed this Friday, the 12th of April, but he will also be aware that the bill that is being discussed in the other place right now does seek to change the date of our departure from the EU, and that is the motion that will be discussed tomorrow should the bill receive royal assent tonight. Sammy Wilson. Would the Leader of the House accept that rather than being condemned for being in contempt of the view of this House. This House should recognise that it, through passing this Bill, is in contempt of the views of the vast majority of people in this country, because they voted to leave. This Bill is seeking to undermine the ability for the UK to leave the European Union, and rather than hang her head in shame at being uh, disdainful for the House, she is right when she says that this Bill is a constitutional outrage and is also a democratic outrage. Well, Mr Speaker, I think the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right that not only is this bill against our conventions, but also it seeks to subvert the will of the people as expressed in the referendum in 2016. It is a great shame and it does not do credit to this House. And Dr Julian Lewis. Instead of trying to do a Ramsay MacDonald in reverse, why doesn't the Prime Minister just let this country leave the EU on time at 11pm on Friday evening? Well, my honourable friend will be aware that the bill that is currently being discussed in the other place will seek to put into law a different date and will seek to ensure that it's not possible for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union this Friday at 11pm. And that is the fundamental problem that we have before us, is that this bill does seek to change the outcome of the referendum by ensuring that the United Kingdom cannot leave the European Union. Jim Cunningham. Very much, Mr. Speaker. Can I remind the Leader of the House that the government lost its majority at the last election? It's a minority government supported by a minority party. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that she should answer the question straight regarding the amendments from the House of Lords and tell exactly. the House with respect what amendments she's prepared to support? Because yeah. a reminder, once again, the House, through its own amendments, has been actually trying to help the government achieve Article 50, contrary to what the government thinks. Yeah, that's well, I can only say to the Honourable Gentleman that when the other House finishes its consideration of the Bill, it will come back to this place for further consideration later this evening, and it will become apparent how all members vote on amendments coming from the other place. Philip A majority of my constituents in Kettering want us to leave the European Union this Friday. Presumably the best way to represent the wishes of local residents in my constituency would be to vote against any extension proposed by the Government. Well, my honourable friend, of course, will decide 
how he, as an individual Member of Parliament, wishes to vote. But I would just say again to all honourable members that the proposal that the Prime Minister negotiated with the European Union over two and a half years seeks to deliver on leaving the European Union whilst at the same time protecting our economy, protecting jobs and protecting our security relationship with the European Union. And I do urge all honourable and right honourable members to keep considering it as the right way to leave the European Union with a deal. Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In response to her comments um, to the member for Kilmarnock and Loudoun, clearly the Leader of the House is unhappy with this bill. But could you not see that the reason why this House has wrested control throughout this through this bill is due to the complete mismanagement of the entire yeah. Brexit process yeah. by this government? Yeah. Yeah. And will she acknowledge yeah. that the lack of majority in this House by her party, not just because her party is so divided, but because the people of the UK have decided that they don't want the government to have full control over this process. Well, uh, the the Honourable Lady is somehow suggesting that the ends justifies the means. I would never support this type of bill being brought forward by the House. A bill of this constitutional significance, if it was introduced by the government, would have gone through extensive consideration, including through the Parliamentary Business and Legislation Committee, comprising business managers, law officers, territorial ministers and others, who would test the policy and the handling plans, ensuring good engagement with colleagues right across the House. There is a private member's bill procedure, which is what this bill is seeking to use, and as such, that would normally be considered on a sitting Friday, and that would go through slowly, enabling the government to check drafting problems, enabling all colleagues to consult on whether they believe this is the right outcome, and so on. What this bill does is, within a couple of hours of debate, with very poor drafting and with a great degree of urgency, seek to challenge the result of the referendum in June, 20, in, Ju- in June 2016, and that simply cannot be justifiable by what the Honourable Lady seems to suggest, that the ends justifies the means. Mr Simon Clark. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I completely echo the comments of the uh, Honourable Lady about the, uh, the abomination that is this bill. I just wanted to put on record that there are many of us who switched our position on Meaningful Vote 3 to support the Government. That was the limit of our tolerance. We bent over backwards to try and get a deal through this House. I simply will be unable to support the Government if it brings forward a customs union. And can she confirm my understanding it would mean we would have no independent trade policy and it would in fact be Brexit in name only? Yeah. Well, what I can say to my honourable friend is that um, the government intends that we should be able to have our own free trade policy once we leave the European Union. That is the, um, that is the discussion that continues to take place, and I do hope that we will find something that means that he and other honourable and right honourable members across the House will be able to support it. <coughs> Marcus Fish. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Leader of the, the House... Um, think that either the government or the opposition or the House understand that a customs union is not a state of frictionless trade and if, if that is proposed does she not think that we should make time in this place so that there can be that understanding? Well said. Well my honourable friend makes a very good point and what I can assure him is that if an arrangement can be reached that does appear to be able to command a majority of the House, then there will be plenty of time for discussion of it. Thank you. Order. Yes.